Breakthrough TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
we get? Okay, it looks like we're about to start here. Oh, that's on a delay. Don't look at that. <clears throat> okay. <sighs> Welcome. This is a field trip for the Exeter Energy Committee. My name is Renee Allen, and I am the chair of the Exeter Energy Committee. Tonight, we're having a virtual tour of the grid, ISO New England. No business will be transacted, as this is just a virtual field trip. But before we start the meeting, we're going to do a roll call of the Energy Committee members. Um, I see Betsy Stevens. Here. Uh, Julie Gilman. Here I am. And Lou Hitzroat. Here. Okay, great. In addition, we have some public attendees and we have some panelists. And lots of people I see in the Zoom here. So at the point when it comes to ask questions, please raise your hand. But before that, Kate is going to give a slide presentation. She has let me know. But before that, let me talk to you a little bit. So part of our energy committee charge is to educate ourselves and the public. You're good. good? Okay, sorry. Um, and tonight I'd like to... Um, to introduce a new committee, a subcommittee that's been formed off of the Energy Committee. This is called the Exeter Community Choice Power Aggregation Committee. The people on this committee are approved by the Exeter Select Board. This is Lou Hitzro, to, to my side here. Ooh. Uh, Cliff Sinnott, Nick Devonshire, and Stephanie Marshall. And a few of these people are in the attendees on the uh, Zoom panel. Let's see. Also, some friends will be here from other energy committees and from Clean Power Coalition of New Hampshire, which is somewhat of a buying block, a new nonprofit that's been formed uh, in response to the municipal aggregation law that was recently enacted be via HB 315. The point of community choice power is to drive clean energy as well as give consumers choice over the power that they buy. Um, this new committee has a schedule that they're going to be using to um, educate the public. So you'll be seeing over the next couple months things rolling out like um, letters to the editor, a panel discussion will be airing on Exeter TV, there'll be trifold brochures at public places, an informational web website, two public info sessions, and then they're going to go before the ele Exeter Select Board to give their proposal. And you may see this on the town ballot in March. But here tonight, we're here to take a view, a tour of the grid, because, let me get up my, um, okay, can we see that? Is that showing anywhere? I hope it is. So tonight we have our virtual field trip to ISO New England, the power grid. Our tour guide is Kate Bashford Epson, and I believe that Kate may have a master's in energy policy, which is very exciting to me. Did you want to share that? So I did. Can see it? Yeah. So if you go to Zoom uh, uh -huh. um, <laughs> on your computer, um, I'll just bring it over, over here. Whoops. Kind of like pretending you're at home. You actually have to, uh, whoops, where'd it go? That's weird. Oh, it minimized. There we go. So if you share screens here, then it will come go right up. ahead. There we go. Thank you. Whoops. I'll just uh, minimize that for you. All right. Can you just pull up High the tech. other one? Uh, sure. While you're here. Oh, great. Okay. So this dashboard that is showing here, this is at the ISO uh, website, and you may want to pull it up on your smartphone as you follow along on Zoom or on the TV if you're watching this later. The little graphic off to the side shows what community power is all about, and ISO New England is kind of the source, not really, it's the pre-source, it doesn't, it's the pre-source anyway. And so Kate's gonna explain to us tonight how it works. And one thing I'd like to say for people who um, may want a, a kind of an overview of it is it's, there's there's solar, there's wind, there's intermediate power, there's, there's full on power, all these things are dancing all together at once. And the grid is kind of like ginger. She's dancing backwards and in high heels, and the whole thing is a symphony that it has to be very carefully orchestrated. So Kate is the person that works there, and she's going to let us know how this all works. Okay, can you let Kate, Kate on? Thank you. Hello. 
Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, um, are you ready to have me share my screen? Yes, go right ahead, Kate, okay. thank you. Well, hello everyone. It's, it's um, nice to be here in the virtual space with you. I'm actually quite close to you. I'm, I'm giving this presentation from uh, my home in Newmarket, so we're not too far apart. Mm. Now, um, it's too bad that we can't be at the actual ISO control center in Holyoke. Um, it's a bit more exciting than my PowerPoint slides, but I'll do the best I can uh, while we're all still working remotely during this pandemic. And I'm gonna try to speak only for about 20, 30 minutes. So there are plenty of time for questions. And, um, you know, however you wanna do it in the room, if you want to interrupt me during my presentation for questions, I'm totally fine with that. So I'll leave it to your chair to make that call. So um, I'm Kate Epson, as Renee said, and I'm in the external and government affairs team at the ISO. Some of you actually may know me from my previous life. I was the executive director of New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association. So um, I, I may know some of you in the room and I hope I get to see you again someday soon. And um, I've been at the ISO for about three years and I cover New Hampshire and Maine as well um, in terms of our government affairs work. So looking at our mission, so I'm gonna refer probably throughout this presentation to our tariff, the ISO tariff. And so really what that is, is just a very large governing legal document that um, guides what we do and has to be approved by our regulator, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, so that's just kind of the broad term for our legal document. And um, this is our mission that is in our tariff that's you know written into that and recently we've gone through a strategic planning process where we developed this vision um, that is looking to the future and essentially committing to really work with the region and the states to enable this uh, clean energy transition and then keep our power system reliable, reliable while doing so. So we have, the ISO has been around for more than 20 years. Um, it was formed as part of what many of the states um, went through in terms of restructuring their electricity sector. And essentially that meant um, taking the utilities that used to own everything from generation, tra transmission and distribution and separating those functions so that there was greater competition, so that there was um, risk that was transferred from consumers to the developers of power plants and other types of energy infrastructure. And so that the ISO would be set up as kind of a neutral platform to help manage this power system. So as I said, we're regulated um, at the federal level um, and we also act as the reliability coordinator for all of New England um, and then we are independent. So we do not have a stake in any of the companies that act in the marketplace, you know, the power companies, the transmission companies, um, we are neutral on technology and we do not have any financial vested interest in, in any of those, those companies or those outcomes. So we, we essentially have three critical functions at the ISO. We manage the grid, and that's really the bulk grid. It's not the poles and wires that you see going into your house or into a business. Um, it's the higher voltage transmission system and the power generators. Um, so we manage that on a second second basis. And um, as you'll see in the next slide, we have a control center to help um, the operators do that. We also administer the electricity markets, and I'll get into that more in a minute. Um, I, I liked your metaphor, Renee, about the the uh, the dance and um, 
us being Ginger Rogers, that's very flattering. Um, and I will pass that along to our operators. A lot of them come out of the um, nuclear submarine, nuclear Navy space. So I'm sure they'll really appreciate that, that metaphor. <laughs> Um, and then we also do power system planning. So we look, you know, three years out, 10 years out, and we say, okay, what reliability metrics do we need to ensure that we are meeting and where are we seeing violations? They might be voltage violations or thermal violations. And, you know, how do we keep um, a highly reliable transmission system and power system to move all of that energy around our region? So here, here's a picture of the control center that you'd see on a real tour. You know, that screen that you see there, that in real life, that's about 12 feet high by maybe, you know, 40 or 50 feet across. It's a, it's a very large screen. And it's a two-dimensional diagram of the entire power system in New England. You know, they're, they're square. You can see those flat little rectangles re representing power plants and then all the line, the transmission lines interconnecting those those systems. Kate, may I so, interrupt you for a minute? Yes, go ahead. I see that we have a raised hand on Lisa Sweet. Um, Bob, could you let Lisa speak, please? And Lisa's with the Rye Energy Committee. I see three or four members of the Rye Energy Committee here. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Okay, hi. I can't see the slides. They're appearing for me as just a little, is this happening for everybody? I don't know, I could switch devices, but the slides are, the, are a small box and I see um, Kate in the bigger one. Is that happening for everybody or am I, I can just switch devices if that's not happening. Oh, she needs to take it off speaker view. I think maybe take it off speaker view um, because we're not okay. seeing that. Actually, I'm not seeing Kate at all. I'm just seeing the screen. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Oh, look, everybody, a couple raised hands here. Andrew Day. Bob, could you please let Andrew speak next? I'm not hearing anything. I'm I don't not know hearing if you are. Any, oh, wait a minute. Here he comes. I see him. I think there's just a, a delay, but I see him up there. Okay. Andrew? I, I was just saying that I was experiencing the same issue, but now it's been fixed, so we can move on. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Technical issues are fixed. All right. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, you know, we, we run these markets, as I just said, um, for transacting electricity sales. And why do we run a competitive market for that space? So I mentioned before, um, there was a desire to add competition um, in the hopes that it would bring down costs and it would add more transparency to um, our entire system in terms of new investment and bringing new resources um, and new technologies into our mix. And then it would really um, take that risk, which was often borne by consumers because the utilities, if they made an investment and it was deemed um, just and reasonable and, and prudent and, and um, met all of those regulatory metrics at the state level, then the consumers would be on the hook for paying for that, um, whether it, you know, proved to be a wise investment or not later on. So that risk, um, that investment risk has now been transferred to developers who take the risk on about bring, of bringing new resources into the market. And since they are, they're competing um, on price, that tends to drive down the price of the wholesale electricity supply. Um, we run three type, three primary types of markets. There's the energy market, which is um, you know where you buy and sell a megawatt hour of electricity, 
on a day ahead basis or a real time spot market basis. Um, there are ancillary services so that, you know, those are those are services that are uh, help maintain the right regulation of the system, the right frequency of the system, um, having reserves, um, you know, for our operating margins, voltage support, things like that. Um, and then there's this forward capacity market that you may have heard something about. That, that is how our region has chosen to um, ensure that we have enough resources to meet demand at any given point in time in the future. Um, we run an auction once a year um, for resources to get an obligation to deliver energy three years from that point in time. So they have some time, you know, if they need to construct it, if it's new, um, and then they get a payment for being available essentially to produce energy when it's needed. And that is how we say, okay, we know we're going to have the, these resources available at this point in time. So we expect to have enough power to meet demand at any given point, regardless of when our peak may be, because it's kind of, it's based off of an estimation of what the peak will be in the future. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of money transacted in these markets. Um, as I said, we're the platform for transacting it. We don't we don't have we don't um, generate the money. We don't hold the money. We just you know exchange the money among the buyers and the sellers. Um, and most of the money is transacted in the energy market. But there the blue part of the bars you'll see are that those are transacted in the forward capacity market. And then that little orange sliver you'll see that's the ancillary services market so that's a much smaller amount of money transacted hmm. this is um this is a busy slide but essentially what it shows you is where iso new england fits into the stakeholder picture of the federal entities that regulate us but also the state level entities um that we interact with so you know we we work with the states, we work with our market participants who have a stakeholder group called NEPOL. Um, we work with a group called the New England States Committee on Electricity, NESCO. Um, and we have an independent board of directors, as I said earlier, that um, helps guide what we do and maintain our, you know, our neutral and independent status of the power system. This is the entire, um, that orange area shows the Eastern interconnection. So what that means is that while where the ISO New England is just operating the part in New England, we are interconnected to this entire orange area. So we're all running on the same frequency, our grids. Um, and then, you know, that means that we have some non-synchronous connections and ties to the gray areas um, that we can exchange limited amounts of power, but we're not um, operating on the same frequency. And these are all subject to a lot of um, various federal standards and regulations. So, you know, a good way to look at the uh, transmission system that we operate, it's an interstate highway system for electricity. And then, you know, the distribution system is more of like the secondary and the back roads and those smaller um, power lines and poles that you see going to homes and businesses. Um, we, we actually get a lot of our energy from imports, from those connections that we have to New York and Canada on a given year. And we um, operate about 9,000 miles of this transmission system altogether. So we use, a, to, to meet the demand, we use a, a mix of both supply and demand side resources. So we have a lot of power plants that are dispatchable, meaning that they can respond to an order from the ISO to maybe ramp their output up more or ramp it to produce less, ramp it down to produce less. Um, but then we also have um, some behind the, you know, behind the meter type of resources as well. We have energy efficiency resources, which serves to lower demand. We have demand response, meaning power can be removed 
um, as needed or demand can be removed from the system as needed um, based on a, a price signal or a dispatch instruction. Um, and then we're also retiring a significant amount of generation as well, which I'll talk about in another slide. Um, we're summer peaking systems, so the most the most power that's demanded um, generally comes in the summer when there's a lot of air conditioning load. But uh, as we look more and more to the future, we're expecting to become a winter peaking system at some point uh, in the future as we tend we're we're electrifying more of our heating and transportation sector. So this is a nice uh, visual about um, the change that we've seen in the electricity system since 2000. You know, you can see this is an energy too. This is so this is in megawatt hours generated, um, not, not megawatts. You know, on the ground r ready to produce. So we used to get a significant amount of our energy, as you can see, from oil and coal, and that's that's gone down dramatically over the past uh, 20 years. You, we get less than 1% from either of those resources. Um, and that it tends to be on a very, very cold day or a very, very hot day. Um, we only have, there's only one coal power plant in fact left in the region and that's in Bow, New Hampshire. Um, and then there, there are a few more oil um, fired power plants or dual capacity that have oil or gas, for example. Um, we're very reliant on natural gas in this region, as you can see. Um, and, but our fastest, the good news is the fastest growing resources are those in the renewables categories, which um, I'll show you more in terms of what's coming down the pipeline in a future slide. So this is just another representation of how we meet, um, how we met all of the energy for the year 2020 uh, last year. And you can see that, you know, it was 20% were imports. 22% was from nuclear, um, almost half was from natural gas, 10% was from renewables, um, which, you know, that includes wind, solar, it, it includes um, biomass, it includes um, landfill gas. So that's, uh, that can be seen in more granular detail too on our, our website, which Renee posted. Um, at any given moment, you can see the exact breakout of, of what is producing power in the region. Generally, um, because natural gas plays such a dominant role still in the electricity system, they, it really influenced the prices of electricity because, um, you know, we clear supply and demand on a competitive basis. And often that clearing resource is coming from a natural gas resource. So they're setting that price for everyone else in the market for electricity. Um, so you can see when there are spikes it's often in the winter when the natural gas is being used for both heating and for electricity. Um, and you, you know, you may have been hearing about some increases coming, uh, coming this winter in the electricity prices for the default service. And that's because we're seeing significant increases in natural gas um, due to a, a big uptick in demand globally. Um, and kind of an imbalance from the supply since there was some decrease in production investment and production during, you know, during COVID in the past uh, year and a half or so. So overall, the um, wholesale electricity prices have been declining, as you can see over the years, um, absent some really dramatic price spikes that tend to occur during the winter. Um, here's a snatch, snapshot of a lot of the plants around the region that have retired since 2013. As I said, most of them um, are coal, oil, and then um, some nuclear as well. You know, we had, um, we had nuclear in Vermont. We had some more nuclear in Massachusetts. And we only have two nuclear power plants left in the region. Um, you know, one in Seabrook, New Hampshire, and then one down in Connecticut. Um, but just those two plants even are still providing over 20% of our annual energy needs. So with, you know, with the retirement of all of this coal and oil, there's been a dramatic uh, decrease in pollutants, which is great. You can see there's a really significant decrease in SOx and NOx um, and uh, a good start on CO2. But obviously, with the climate targets of most of the states in New England, we have further to go on that. 
um, this is just a nice snapshot of all of the state's goals um, to reduce their carbon emissions by 2050 through 2030, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, every state except for New Hampshire has a binding legally required um, emissions target. And so the ISO is very committed to working with all the states and, and with you know, FERC, our regulator, to really help enable um, these success, successfully meeting these goals. Um, here's an example of the renewable portfolio standards across the region. Um, the New Hampshire's is that lower light orange bar. Um, and you can see the other states have continued to kind of increase their targets for renewable energy through their renewable portfolio standard. And for those who don't, of you who don't know about renewable for, portfolio standards, it's just, it's generally a requirement for um, the load serving entity, often the utility, but it could be a competitive supplier to provide some amount of their retail sales from renewable energy attributes. So here's our interconnection queue. So one of the functions that we do, obviously, is, as I said, it's we we plan the system and then we um, we study the system. So as we bring on new resources and resources retire, we can make sure that reliability is maintained. And so any system that any new generator that wants to interconnect the system um, needs to be studied and, and it has to go through an interconnection process. And um, it's on a first come first serve basis. So our interconnection queue is quite big right now. It has over 30,000 megawatts in it. Um, our, keep in mind, this is in a system where we have about 30,000 megawatts currently available to produce energy for New England. So that doesn't mean all of this will get built, um, but it gives you a really good sense of um, the shift that's happened in terms of what resources are going to be coming into the electricity sector. So huge amount of wind, most of that's offshore wind, um, a lot, lots of solar, as you can see, lots of battery storage. Just when I even started at the ISO, this was almost a negligible amount. So just in three years, it's gone up dramatically. Natural gas, you can see it's only 3% in the queue right now. That used to be about 60% of the interconnection queue. So we're really seeing an exciting transition of resources right now that's underway. Um, energy storage is obviously going to play a really important part of the system because we have to meet supply and demand instantaneously. Um, and electricity is notoriously hard to store. But um, as the technology gets better, whether it's with batteries or whether it's with other storage technologies, that's going to really help balance the um, variable nature of a lot of renewable energy resources. So right now we actually have two pumped hydro storage facilities on the system. They can provide up to 1800 megawatts um, of power for up to seven hours. So that's a, that's a pretty valuable resource. Um, and then we have about 20 megawatts of batteries that are dispatchable in the system. But as you saw just in that previous slide, we have um, thousands more proposed to come, to come on to help kind of provide that provide both energy and um, ancillary services and balancing services. Um, we do forecasting, as I said, we look 10 years out to provide forecasting on um, what is it, you know, what is the region gonna, going to look like in terms of, you know, economic growth? What does that mean for electricity growth? Where is that growth going to be? Is it going to be, you know, in, in Southern New England? Is it going to be in Northern New England? you know, what kind of transmission do we have to move all of that power around? You know, say we build a lot of offshore wind, how are we going to bring that offshore? Um, so we look at various um, categories. We look at energy efficiency, and that's predicted to continue to go up. Um, the states are very invested in, in, in um, expanding energy efficiency. And um, we're, we just started a year ago to look at heating and electrification, heating electrification and transportation electrification, since a lot of states um, have that in their plan to in terms of how they're going to reach their carbon emissions reduction. So what does that mean? You know, it's, it means rather than heating your house with oil, um, you might get a heat, air source heat pump or, you know, you might buy an electric vehicle rather than using gasoline. And so you have to charge 
that vehicle um, using a grid and you have to, you know, you have to use electricity to run that air source heat pump. Um, energy efficiency and behind the meter solar are significantly reducing our annual energy use. So all those investments pay off in terms of reducing the amount that needs to be supplied otherwise by power plants over the course of the year. So you can see in that um, nice little line graph what our annual energy use would be without energy efficiency and without um, behind the meter solar. We would, it would be that top orange line. Whereas if we net those two resources out, it's that bottom green line. So that's the, sa the gray areas, the savings we see on the course of the year. Um, same same um, effect on peak demand. You know, we, we base a lot of our system on what the peak hour will be in the summer. And so any savings that we can see to lower that peak um, are shared by the whole region. And those same two resources, energy efficiency and behind the meter solar, significantly reduce the peak demand, as you can see, to where that green line is. So, you know, in um, over the next 10 years, it's about a 5,000 megawatt uh, difference in having those resources versus not having them. Um, and 5,000 megawatts, um, that's fairly significant. That's, that would be, you know, about five nuclear power plants, for example. So here's the forecast we have in terms of predicting the amount of solar um, in the region through 2030. Right now, we're at about 4,000 megawatts, and we're um, forecasting that that will go up to about 10,000 megawatts um, by 2030. Um, here, it's showing what we have by state. Um, and this is as of December 2020. So you can see New Hampshire um, has about 125 megawatts of solar currently installed. Um, and that's over 10,000 uh, installations. So it's over, you know, a lot of small installations. And you can probably all guess why if you're familiar with the net metering policy in New Hampshire. Um, this is the duck curve, which some of you may have seen. So it's a phenomenon that is seen when there um, is a lot of solar power on an electrical in, in an electrical system. So um, what what the ISO sees on, for example, this this day, this is a real day that we experienced. We saw the lower solid line in terms of what the demand on the regional grid was. So um, the de what, what's very interesting is the demand at 3 p.m. went lower than the demand was on the system at 4 a.m. And that's because um, there was so much solar that came online that day that instead of that dashed line, which was the tr which would have been the demand absent of all that solar power, um, it that it dropped and that entire orange yellow area was the energy provided by the solar systems across New England. Now what that create, the reason it's called a duck curve is because it's supposed to be kind of the outline of a duck's profile. And then um, when the sun starts to set, it ramps up rather fast and rather dramatically. And so there just need to be a lot of resources, regardless of what they may be, whether it was batteries or natural gas or wind or et cetera, there just needs to be a lot of fast starting power that can keep the system balanced as that demand stays there, but the solar starts to drop off. So we, um, we are um, working with a lot of variable uh, resources, um, as I said, a lot of these state policies are driving the new resources that are coming online, um, and we're doing a lot to keep the system balanced. Um, we're looking at um, a lot of new market design options to help incent balancing resources, to help um, value flexibility on the system, which will be important, and also to keep the system competitive um, and attract the resources that the uh, states would like to see. 
So um, I think, you know, I'll go, I've said, I've said a lot of this, you know, we're looking to really transition to a, both a clean and a competitive resource mix. So I won't repeat myself here. Um, I'm looking at the time and I wanted to talk just a tiny bit about transmission planning since it's our third core function, but I'm going to try to wrap up in two minutes here so I can save more time if folks have questions. Um, we conduct a lot of planning and we do, we do it through an open stakeholder process. You know, for example, we have a committee called the planning advisory committee that folks can participate in. Um, you can go to our website, get all of the information on this planning advisory committee. And the, really the only restriction is certain documents have critical energy infrastructure information, and you just have to apply for um, clearance to be able to view some of those dockets, documents. But that's not everything. Um, and you can certainly participate in the planning advisory committee. So we, um, we, you know, we look at each of the region, each of the subregions in New England, you know, for example, northern Maine, southern Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, southern Massachusetts, northern Massachusetts thing. Um, and we do needs assessments. We see where might there be problems coming down the road and can we solve those problems with transmission Um can that transmission solution be developed competitively or does it need to be developed um, on a short-term basis because the need is very urgent, um, things like that. And we look at all of that um, in terms of also improving the reliability of the system to avoid things like congestion, um, and we want to move, be able to move the cheapest power around to the load centers. So, you know, there are, there are market benefits as well to having a robust transmission system. So here, here's the amounts that have been invested in that transmission system over the past several years. You know, it's, it's been quite a bit of money and there's still about another billion dollars in future planned projects over the next few years. Um, there's also a lot of talk um, at the regional and the federal level about building out the transmission system even more to uh, bring in more renewable energy. And, you know, I don't know what that will look like, but it could look like very high voltage lines that bring power, you know, from entirely different regions, you know, say the Midwest that has a lot of wind. Um, it could be more transmission that works to bring um, offshore wind uh, you know, off of um, the Gulf, off of the Gulf of Maine, or off of some southern New England, um, into into the region, um, and basically, a lot of the renewable energy yet to be developed is not exactly where the load is, so it has to be moved around with transmission. Um, I mentioned this: um, how there are a lot of benefits to added transmission beyond reliability. This is, um, this is just an important um, slide about how, how is this all paid for? So, you know, when, when an investment needs to be made in the regional power system, that's, a, that's going to be a shared cost among, among all the states. And what it's, what it's essentially based on is your share of the load. Um, so New Hampshire right now is at about 10% of that amount. And you can see that, you know, Massachusetts is obviously a big share of the load. So they pick up almost half of those costs. And that's, that's whether the project's built in New Hampshire, if, you know, for example, the Seacoast Reliability Project, we still only paid 10% of that, or whether the project's in Connecticut or Massachusetts, for example. Um, so, you know, we're seeing, this is a really exciting time. We're seeing a big shift um, from a lot of kind of large scale conventional power plants where power flows in one direction to the consumer to a really, uh, you know, a busier system, a lot of small systems, a lot of behind the meter systems, um, a lot of, you know, renewable energy systems. And um, it's, it's an interesting uh, technical challenge to be able to, um, balance those loads and those supply, th that supply um, on that minute to minute basis. So here are some additional publications that we have. Um, they're on our website, or I'm happy to kind of email Renee to share with all of you. And we do have an app. We have an app that is very handy. It's free. 
Um, it's easy to download. So instead of going to our website, you can just look on your phone and you can see what the prices are, what the power um, mix is at any given moment. Um, and you can get local alerts too. So if there's an issue on the grid, you'll get an alert right to your phone. And with that, I'm happy to take any more questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to state for um, transparency reasons that another member of the Energy Committee, Cliff Sinnott, arrived at the beginning of your, uh, your presentation. So Cliff's in the room too. Cliff is on the Energy Committee and on the Community Power Aggregation Committee. So I, I have a question. I'll start you off here. So on slide 22, you were talking about you had a, a graph up there. It was a, a kind of a pie chart, and it had a really big purple section of offshore wind. And I was wondering if that offshore, if that future, if if that future wind was offshore wind, or if it had the um, projected Gulf of Maine project in there, or if it was something else. So the, you know that that it was about nineteen thousand megawatts in the queue, um, and li listed as wind. And so most of that is offshore wind, and um, out of you know the the main portion of that. Uh, it's about 2,500 megawatts in the queue. Now, Maine is a little bit less further along than Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island because the Gulf of Maine is deep water. And so it will likely have to be floating turbines and they haven't conducted federal leases yet. Um, so some of some of the main um, uh, interconnection queue of resources is onshore still as well. Does that make sense? It's, yes. it's a mix. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Renee, I've got a question. I think you got to go right there. Oh, I'm Let me oh. speak into it. Oh, I'm cute. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. Kate, um, I'm wondering what role ISO New England will play in, um, in the New Hampshire PUC's planning and uh, and developing regulations for uh, com community power aggregations, is is ISO New England um, do they in some way interact with the New Hampshire PUC in producing those regulations? What's what's the relationship there? We don't really have a role in producing those regulations. That's that's purely state jurisdictional policy making. Um, so we're we're here to be a resource to the, to the states um, when they need us. So we can you know if they have questions or they need information or you know you know we're here to help. But we we likely won't play any formal role in that process. The Federal um, Power Act essentially draws the line in terms of where jurisdiction lies. And so when it affects retail rates, that's all this, that's all in the state jurisdiction. We only um, act when it's about wholesale inter, you know, interstate transactions or the bulk transmission system. That's our jurisdiction. Thanks. Are these live? Yeah, I think so. I think Cliff has a question. Yes, hi, Kate. Um, you had an interesting slide there showing the relative state uh, renewable portfolio standard goals. Um, and if I was looking at it correctly, it looked like most of the New England states had goals that ranged from 50 to, almost, uh, in Massachusetts' case, 100% by either 2050 or 2060. And I'm wondering, is that, um, how does that compare, first of all, with the total renewables that are in the portfolio of the ISO now, uh, or what's delivered? And how, <laughs> what kinds of implications are there to get to those sorts of goals and by 2050? Um, so, so yes, the states do have fairly aggressive uh, renewable energy goals. Um, and since we're still in the year 2021, there definitely needs to be more renewables that come online to meet those goals. And, you know, I would say each state tends to do their own study to look at, you know, like a market assessment study to say, 
what do we need to do? What are our pathways to get to our 2040 or 2050 goal? And um, some states find that they're somewhat on track. Um, some states say, okay, we need to, we're going to need to bring on, you know, X amount per year. Now, but keep in mind, um, the, the renewable portfolio standards are met with RECs, renewable energy certificates. And so that's um, a symbol of an attribute of renewable energy. And the renewable energy electricity itself, that's a separate transaction. But since the resources generally have to be certified um, in New England, it, they correlate well. But it, it's, the RPS um, goal attainment isn't for the electricity itself. It's for the, ener the renewable electricity credit or certificate. Does that make sense? Where are we now in terms of the percentage of electricity used in New England that comes from renewable sources? Um, so we're at about, as I, sh I showed on an earlier slide, we're at about 10%, 10 percent okay. right now coming from renewables, but then we're getting about 7% from hydro. And so depending on, you know, if a state recognizes a particular type of hydro or not, you know, that would put that puts it at about 17 percent today. OK, thanks. Um, at this time, I'd like to see if any of the attendees have any questions. You can raise your hand. We'll address those. Um, and while we're waiting for that, Kate, maybe I can ask you, since um, Massachusetts already has a community power aggregation plan, um, do you know um, how that affected or how their, how their aggregation buying drives clean energy in the New Hampshire, in, in the Massachusetts sector? I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that well. I don't exactly know the level of detail about how their aggregation policy is playing out across Massachusetts in terms of like d driving demand for renewable energy. I do know that a, a big driver of demand that's going on are the procurements that Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island are holding. And those are for kind of larger scale resources like offshore wind. Um, and that's certainly driving a significant amount of demand as well as their policies like their SMART program. Um, and so it's unclear to me, you know, what, where the community power aggregation policy plays into that mix of influence. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? All right, and I don't see anything from the attendees. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation and for answering the questions for us, Kate. Is there any, any last things you'd like to leave us with? Um, n no, thank, thank you so much for having me. And we, the ISO is hoping to return from its remote posture in January. And so we will just keep everyone posted in terms of when we resume tours, um, which you know we're certainly not going to be doing at least through that point. Uh, Kate, one quick question: uh, Are the uh, slides available? Uh, are your slides available? Yeah, I'll share them with uh, Renee, and then she can Great. post them, or you can use them however you like. Thanks. Great, because that was a lot of information. So this has been recorded. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah, this has been recorded and we'll show, uh, we'll show on TV and we'll also have um, links where you can watch it. Now, I also see we do have an attendee. Howard has his hand raised. Could we have his voice, please? Yes, uh, the question I had is uh, transmitting Texas wind. How capable is... Uh, ISO to bring that to the New England market. I understand the Texas grid is somewhat limited in uh, transmitting to other grids. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, t Texas um, is somewhat of an islanded system, so we cannot um, access their wind energy uh, in New England. Okay. Okay. 
All right, then I guess that wraps it up. Thank you, everybody. And I think uh, I need maybe a motion to close this field trip meeting. So moved. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you to the attendees. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at ExeterNH.TV, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.